This is a very fulfilling period in my life, complete solely with Auschwitz. One month ago, I realized my first dream to arrange an international conference on the works of Yechiel Dinur, better known as Katzetnik, the most important novelist on Auschwitz in the world. This conference already took place in Calgary, Canada. I initiated the conference and conducted it. And this Zonder Commander conference was, conference, uh, was indeed my second dream, but in this case, I did not have to do anything. You, uh, Philippe, and you, Frederick, you initiated it and are directing it. Thank you so much for the honor. And my third dream will take place only next November in Köln, Germany, when I will inaugurate the exhibition I'm doing with Mr. Peter Siebers called The Other Planet, Topography of Auschwitz at the LD House, previously the Gestapo headquarters in Köln. This was a short introduction, and now to our subject. <clears throat> the last 30 years of my life are dedicated to the subject of Sonderkommando docu documentation and research. Nobody asked me to do it, nobody authorized me, nobody forced me to invest my whole life to the most depressing topic on Earth. I decided to do it voluntarily, this was foremost a project of rescue, saving for future generations the, pre the precious and unique testimonies of the men who, working as slaves in the biggest death factory in the world, saw everything to the last detail, everything which the Germans wanted us never to see and never to know. It was a struggle against time to save those testimonies before the last survivors of the Sonderkommando die and take all reminiscences with them. I was lucky. 31 men all over the world in four continents, the last survivors of the crematoria teams in Birkenau, opened their doors and hearts before me and told me their shocking stories. Many people all over the world, including some of my colleagues, told me that after two or three pages, they had to stop. Most of my interviewees are dead by now, including the gentleman you've seen just on the screen. Their stories, however, will live to forever. From the 31 interviewed Sonderkommando men, I would like to mention two survivors who made the strongest impression on me. One of them was Rabbi Joshua Rosenblum, of Polish origin, who lived in Haifa, Israel. And the second was Leon Cohen, born in Thessaloniki, who lived in Batyam, also Israel. Rosenblum worked mainly in the undressing room, and Leon Cohen was the so-called dentist. The only survivor who stubbornly refused to be interviewed lives, perhaps not surprisingly, in Mannheim, Germany. The main scientific issue which stood naturally and obviously at the center of my research was the question of authenticity of the field in historical research called oral history. Historians are divided concerning the evaluation and appreciation uh, and taking seriously testimonies of survivors of the Holocaust, in some cases dozens of years after the event under discussion. In this problem, questions about the limits of memory, objectivity on the shaping of memory are of course very cent central. After interviewing hundreds of Auschwitz survivors and all the still living Sonderkommando survivors, I, cannot, I can only uh, conclude that the Holocaust can never be described and understood without the oral history testimonies. The personal testimonies have no substitute. Most German documents do not include the information nor the atmosphere and sentiments which are included in the personal testimonies. So my conclusion, I was and remain a big believer in the oral history 
and the collection of Sonderkommando interviews I have conducted is a precious contribution to our understanding to the death factory of Auschwitz-Birkenau specifically and the Shoah in general. Today, I would like to share with you this long and exhausting historical project, which is already 30 years old, in a retrospective way and ask, what does this research tell us? What can we learn from it? What does it contribute to our knowledge about Auschwitz, about the final solution, about the Shoah? What can be derived from thousands of pages of testimonies of the Sonderkommando survivors? My research was aimed at discovering two fields of, of existence. The technical data concerning the process of mass killing in the gas chamber and crematoria, and the inner life of the Sonderkommando members in their barracks, an important topic as well. I have summed up the results uh, and fruits of my research in the following 12 points. One, for the first point to be mentioned, I would like to cite a sentence included in The Drowned and the Saved, one of the most important books of Primo Levi. After being already, after being already mentioned by so many participants uh, in this important conference, I've actually decided not to mention Primo Levi anymore but I had to surrender since the following sentence is so significant. And I'm citing. The invent, to invent the idea of the Sonderkommandos and organize and create these units is the worst crime of national socialism. Indeed, to force Jews to work in a place where millions of Jews are brutally murdered through poisonous gas is the worst crime possible of the Germans. The research clearly and shockingly exposes the murder lust of the Germans, their sadism, their brutality, their aggression, their joy being able to eliminate the biggest enemies of, the, of Germany and humanity, namely the Jews. Point number two. The second contribution this research donates to us is the clear, detailed, comprehensive and realistic data about the death industry which characterized the death factory Auschwitz. Our knowledge about the mass industrial killing machinery in Auschwitz-Birkenau could have been very limited and partial have we missed the profound knowledge from the memoirs, memories uh, of the survivors of the Sonderkommando. Some of those men worked there more than one year, others even more than two years. They have seen everything. They have witnessed everything, day and night. Usually, they were stationed in a permanent part inside this assembly line, as for instance, in the undressing hall, in the ovens hall, or near the corpse. But as in every factory, every normal factory, they also were occasionally told to change places and replace a sick comrade or a murdered comrade. It means that each of them saw actually everything in the process of the Auschwitz death industry. The German sources which are available, available are limited. The information on behalf of the Jewish sources are, is essential in order to receive a complete picture. The testimonies of the Sonderkommando survivors supply this unique information we need. I tried to go into the smallest detail, and it was sometimes very painful, very delicate, and sometimes even very embarrassing. But I did not give up. In history, and especially in the history of a crime, the details have weight and importance. The survivors were reluctant, tried to switch the subject, tried to escape. I left no way out. I knew how important and urgent this information is. I'm happy I, ins I insisted, though I apologized before them. To point number three. 
The research enables us to fully realize the methods of deceit, deception, fraud and cheating of the Germans, which were an integral part of the crime, an integral part of the final solution. The research shows the full repertoire of the Germans to hunt their helpless victims into the trap. Every tr tr trick, every exercise was legitimate in reaching the goal of reducing the victims' awareness and in betraying them. The fraud began already before the deportation of the victims to the camp by telling them false information about the goal of deportation and about the purpose of the journey. After arrival, nothing was said about the real nature of the camp, about the real intention behind the so-called selection, and shortly before entering the undressing hall, nothing was told about the forthcoming death. In the contrary, all efforts were introduced to increase the illusion of the victims, to make them feel secure, to create a peaceful, non-threatening atmosphere. The survivors described all those fraud tactics in details. The deception, a central method in the general policies of National Socialism, comes to its climax in the extermination camps, and thanks to the survivors' testimonies, we can get the full scale and dimension of it. And now to point number four. A very significant contribution of the research is the fact that it verifies and confirms the authenticity and accuracy of the Auschwitz scrolls, the clandestine hidden writings compiled by members of the Sonderkommando who wrote and hid in the grounds of Birkenau numerous collections and reports on their work, including detailed information about the murder action of the Germans and their vicious cruelty, the fraud methods, the naivety of the victims, the inner life of the Sonderkommando men, their solidarity, their inner structure, their rivalries, their hopes and despair. The similarity between the late interviews and the written documents is very clear and proves that the authors of the Auschwitz scrolls were loyal chronologists of their time, supplying us authentic realistic details and reports on the death factory Auschwitz-Birkenau. All authors of the Auschwitz scrolls are dead by now. We can't ask them about the background of their texts, nor can we verify the data included in their texts. I have to emphasize that the Auschwitz scrolls published in many languages, recently I was partner in publishing a new edition of Grodowski's writings in Israel, only in Hebrew, are considered nowadays one of the most important sources on Auschwitz and the final solution. Now to point number five. The Zonderkommando research us, enables us better to know and understand the behavior, reaction and human patterns of other groups of prisoners in Auschwitz-Birkenau. We can thus get detailed information on the Poles in Auschwitz and their attitudes towards the Jews about the gypsies, or better to say Sinti and Roma, and their behavior towards the Jews and other groups of prisoners in the camp. A very interesting question is, for instance, the relation between the Jewish headquarter of the Sonderkommando and the headquarter of the International Kampfgruppe in the main camp Stammlager Auschwitz. To point number six. The research supplies a very clear picture depicting the last minutes of the Jews on the edge of their deaths. None of the Jews sentenced to death ever could leave the crematoria area alive. None left the area of death intact. Therefore, we, lacked even one, we lack even one voice of the murdered Jews. The survivors told me several stories which portray a very dignified picture on the behavior of the Jews sentenced to death. The gather, gathered information shows clearly that the Jews were not losing their dignity before dying, were not asking the murderers anything, and were 
ready to accept the reality without pleading or asking the Germans for any favor. They did not betray their religion, their tradition. They remained loyal to the national and moral principles. The testimonies of Sonderkommando survivors is essential in reconstructing the last minutes before Cyclone B began poisoning the people standing in the gas chambers. The Sonderkommando men also could hear the screams of the suffocated Jews in the first minutes after the gas started to kill the people. The testimonies report about strong, loud screams and mainly prayers, Shema Israel and others. It is a very important evidence about the process, short process, of the human reaction after realizing that everything promised was nothing more than deceit, lying, fraud, and illusion. To point number seven. The research sheds a light on the inner life of the Sonderkommando members, about their free time, about the of duty hours in their sealed barracks, the patterns of negotiating with the SS, their relations with the Greek Jews in the Sonderkommando, their relation with other prisoners in the camp, including problematic aspects in the behavior of the Sonderkommando members themselves. The moral level of some of the Sonderkommando members is already dealt in the Auschwitz scrolls and the testimonies emphasize those problematic lines. To point number eight. The research on the Sonderkommando exposes a very important aspect which cannot be found in any other source. The personality of the SS personnel working in the gas chambers, their character, personal hobbies, lines of sadism, brutality, aggression, and even sometimes sense of humor. Very childish humor, but still humor. Their nature, ways of reaction, the name which always appears is Otto Moll, the manager or the so-called manager of the crematoria, but he's not the only one. Some appear with their nickname, since the Sonderkommando people did not know their real names. Moll, perhaps the most cruel person ever born on this earth, represents the zealous national socialist who fulfills to the utmost the race theory of the Germans. To point number nine now. The research exposes in clear lines the big problems concerning underground organization in an extermination or concentration camp and in uniting several elements in one, into one fighting group, overcoming religious, ethnical, national differences, and especially obstacles of prejudices, ego, big ego, ego lack of solidarity, and sometimes envy. The problems which I have just mentioned reduced the effectivity of the struggle and helped the Germans sometimes to fight back effectively. To point number 10. The research also enables us to better understand the Sonderkommando uprising <coughs> on October 7th, 1944, including the period of preparation, the dilemmas, the problematic cooperation with the Polish underground movement in the camp, the participation of the Soviet prisoners of war, and many other aspects. To point 11. The research is a unique document on the soul of human being in the most extreme situation ever possible. The Sonderkommandos were the ultimate, the Sonderkommando profession was the ultimate trial to men and humanity. I think and am convinced that in the history of mankind there was no similar human experience like this one. 
The research shows clearly that the Zonder Commando people were no collaborators. And I have to emphasize it once more. They were no collaborators, no killers, no criminals. The research puts the participants on both sides of the coin as it should be. On one side, the Germans, the real killers, and on the others, their victims and the Sonderkommando are included. They are the victims of the victims, or in Hebrew, better sounds better, Haumlalim, Sheba Umlalim. We learn much from the testimonies of the Sonderkommando people about their efforts to ease for the Jews the last minutes to prevent them from unnecessary humiliation and shame. They try to do everything to ease the last moments of the Jews, not to embarrass them, and in most cases, even not to tell them the truth, to grant them some last few minutes of mercy. And I'm convinced also that the Zonderkommando people should not be included and judged within the group called the functionaries, or in German, die Funktionäre, which fulfilled a list of uh, positions in the camps, like Block Älteste, Block Älteste, Capo, Block Schreiber, etc. They belong to a special, unique category. The position they had was unique, which can't be compared with other professions, functionaries in the camp. And to emphasize once more, the killers were always the Germans. The gas was poured into the camps by the Germans with no exception. We, as the prisoners told me, we were the robots. We were the living machines. And as Shaul Hazan told me, we were doing the black work of the Holocaust. And to the two last points, summing up my research. The research can be used as a very efficient weapon in the war against denial of the Holocaust. And already it was used for this purpose, for instance, during the trial of Deborah Lipster, the American Jewish historian, against the famous uh, Auschwitz denier David Irving, some years ago, some testimonies of the uh, Sonderkommando prisoners were used. And to the last uh, point, we owe the detailed information to the memory of the murdered Jews and other is innocent men women and children murdered in the gas chambers in Auschwitz-Birkenau. You certainly know that not only Jews were murdered, there are also many thousands of Poles, Sinti and Roma, and Soviet prisoners of war. The humiliated murdered Jews, as well as the others, did not want to die anonymously. They certainly wanted us to know how they were cheated, how they were misled, how they were brought into the trap of death, and the testimonies supply this kind of information. Thank you very much. <laughs>